Today's video is about specific heat capacity and specific latent heats. As you'll have seen from the specification references, we do not really need to be able to do very much with this, but we have to be able to use the equations. And to use the equations properly, you really need to understand what it is you're talking about. So let's get into it and look at specific heat capacity. If we think about the word capacity, we know that the capacity, for example, of a large water bottle might be 1.5 litres. The capacity of a tank could be 5,000 litres. So capacity tells us how much something will hold. And so heat capacity then tells us how much heat something will hold before its temperature increases by one degree Celsius. And then specific heat capacity is how much temperature a material will hold per kilogram before its temperature goes up by one degree Celsius. Now here it's worth talking about the units of temperature. Back at GCSE when we did this, we always referenced it in terms of degrees Celsius, and we can still do that here. However, for the rest of thermodynamics, we really need to use the Kelvin scale of temperature. Now, the Kelvin scale of temperature and the degree Celsius scale of, scale of temperature have the same intervals, so a change of one degree Celsius is the same as a change in one degree Kelvin. And we're looking at temperature changes here. So it is pretty much interchangeable. You can use either one in this situation. But because you do have to use Kelvin for the rest of thermodynamics, it is a good idea to get into the habit of thinking in terms of Kelvin. Let's have a look at some examples. So water, one of the highest specific heat capacities, which gives it all kinds of cooling applications. Water has a specific heat capacity of 4,000, almost 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree Kelvin. That is telling you that it will take 4,200 joules to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree, Kelvin or Celsius. Contrast that with cooking oil, and it's about half. And then as you go down, the metals have very low specific heat capacities. And that means that it doesn't take much energy to heat up a metal for its temperature to rise. So you add 128 joules to one kilogram of lead, and its temperature will go up by one degree whereas you have to add 4,200 joules to one kilogram of water to get its temperature to go up by one degree. This makes water an excellent energy absorber because it absorbs an awful lot of energy before its temperature starts to rise. And of course, it's not going to become gas until 100 degrees Celsius. So you've got quite a large space interval of energy absorption there before the water will turn into water vapor. The equation that goes with specific heat capacity, sometimes you see it as delta Q. Q is the symbol that's given for heat energy in particular. And on our specification, it gives it as delta E. That is the amount of energy that has to be added is equal to the mass of the substance times its specific heat capacity times the change in temperature that you're going to achieve. So if you rearrange this, you'll see that C is equal to change in energy over mass times change in temperature. And this is where joules per kilogram per degree Celsius comes in. We need to be able to use this equation. That's what our specification says. And we will come to an example at the end of this, and I will show you exactly how to use it. Some more quick examples of specific heat capacities. You can see here it's given in joules per gram per degree Celsius. And that's also very normal. Obviously, if it's joules per gram, you just multiply it by a thousand to get to joules per kilogram. And you can see here that water has, in fact, a specific heat capacity of 4,184 joules per kilogram per degree. Ice, you'll notice, has a different specific heat capacity. And that is something that we're going to be exploring a little further with the specific latent heats. But again, it's just a list of numbers you can see. There's that lead at 128. You do not need to remember any of these, not even water. If you need the specific heat capacity to calculate, it will always be given to you. Something that it is quite common to see is a graph like this of temperature against time. And first thing I'd like to point out is that temperature should be in degrees Celsius with a slash and not with a bracket. What you can see here 
on the sloping lines, this is the particular state. And this, we are seeing the increase in temperature of the particular state. If you look at this graph, the gradient of these lines gives you an indication of how quickly the temperature is increasing, and therefore gives you an indication of the specific heat capacity. It isn't quite the specific heat capacity, but it gives you an idea. So something with a lower gradient would be heating up much more slowly, and that would tell you then that it has a higher specific heat capacity, and vice versa. What's happening in these flat areas here are the phase changes and you'll notice you get no temperature increase during the phase change so let's take solid as an example the solid's temperature increases until all of the solid is at its melting point and then you get no further temperature increase even though you keep adding energy you get no further temperature increase while the solid changes into a liquid and then once all the solid is a liquid again you go back to the specific heat capacity of the liquid version of that material and its temperature starts going up again. So we need to be able to work with not just the increase in temperature of, let's say, a solid, but also any changes that happen as it changes its state and then any temperature increases that might happen in the next state up. And in order to do that, we have to look at the specific latent heats of a substance. So the specific latent heat, and I'm just going to shorten it to SLH, is the energy that's required to change one kilogram of a substance from one state to another. So again, we're keeping on the one kilogram theme here so that we can multiply up to as many kilograms as we need to. Notice here we have two types of change of state or specific latent heat, we have the specific latent heat of fusion. That's the one for melting, changing from a solid to a liquid. The specific latent heat of vaporization, then, is the one for boiling, changing from a liquid to a gas. And you can see that we have different numbers for the specific latent heat of fusion and the specific latent heat of vaporization. So for example, water has this much for fusion, a good deal more for vaporization, about 10 times more. And the equation to, that you use to figure out the energy that's required to change state is fairly straightforward. Again, the energy that has to be supplied is how much mass changes state, because it's per kilogram, multiplied by this L value. Now, both latent heats both fusion and vaporization are given the symbol L. You just need to work with whichever one is relevant at the time, whether the object or the substance is melting or whether the substance is boiling. And again, these are not numbers that you need to know. These are numbers that will always be given to you if you have to do a calculation. And the specification says we need to be able to work with these equations. So let's have a go. The wet handkerchief is dried in 56 seconds using a hot iron rated at 2,400 watts. Okay, the first thing we need to realize is that if the wet handkerchief is dried, we know that water has gone from its liquid state to its gaseous state. So we know we're going to have specific latent heats in here. Determine whether energy is transferred to the water in the handkerchief at a greater rate then it is transferred to the iron. So we know it's transferred the, to the iron at 2,400 watts. We want to figure out what energy rate is energy transferred to the water. So we need the power. And that's where this 56 seconds comes in. So we'll just put a little mental tag on that one. That's our T. And we'll come back to this later. It tells us the initial temperature of the wet handkerchief was 18 degrees. And the mass of the wet and the mass of the dry. So, what this tells us is that we're also going to have to use specific heat capacity because the handkerchief wasn't at 100 degrees and therefore the water in the handkerchief wasn't at 100 degrees to start with. And these numbers here give us the mass of the water. So let's do that first, find out what the mass of the water is, and if you subtract those, you get 17.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. And of course, at this point, this initial stage where you're just sort of feeling your way through the question, it's a great idea to convert all of your units into SI units so you don't 
make a mistake and leave them in grams later on. We're given the specific heat capacity of water and we're given the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. Okay, so this is a two-stage process. The first stage, we have to find out how much energy does it take to get the water in the handkerchief from 18 degrees to 100 degrees. And that is our specific heat capacity equation. And I know in our specification, they write it as delta theta. Delta T is just the same thing. Um, the second stage is to go, okay, how much energy is then used to take it from water at 100 degrees into steam? And so we're going to add those two energies together. And that essentially becomes our calculation here. So our energy that needs to be supplied then is, first of all, the energy that is going to take to get the handkerchief from 18 degrees to 100 degrees, and then plus the energy that it's going to take to get the wet water evaporated off or boiled off the handkerchief, which is change in mass times L. And once we've established that, then all we're doing is putting the numbers in. And let's do that. So we have 17.7 times 10 to the minus 3 times 4.19 times 10 to the minus 3. And we do a little mental check that it's all in the correct units. Yes, it is times our change in temperature, which is going to be 100 degrees, because that's the maximum temperature water can get to, minus 18, because that was our starting water temperature. And I'm going to put a square bracket around that, plus, again, our 17.7 times 10 to the minus 3, because that's how much water evaporated, times our specific latent heat in the right unit, 2.26 minus 10 to the 6. Now, it's simply a matter now of getting your calculator out, putting the brackets in the right place, making sure you've got everything sorted out, and we get... That's for the specific heat capacity. There's the specific latent heat. And so we end up with... Forty thousand and eighty-three joules. Now that is the energy supplied, and we were asked for what rate it was supplied at. So we have to turn it into power. And of course we should know that power is energy over time. So we divide this by 56 seconds, and we end up with 822.9 and change watts. 823 watts. You are not finished yet, though, because it does say determine is it transferred at a greater rate than it's transferred to the iron. Now, common sense tells you, of course, it can't be. But we've just calculated it, and when it says determine, you have to make a statement at the bottom. So you have to say 823 watts is less than 2,400 watts. Therefore, it is not transferred at a greater rate. Don't forget that when it says determine, that you have to put this in the statement at the bottom. You can use uh, greater than and less than symbols, but you've got to make a written statement. Let's talk a minute about approaching a question like this. Like I said at the start, it's a great idea to start labeling what you're given in the question first, and then sort out any unit parts. There'll be a mark for calculating the mass of the water like this but you're more interested in just getting everything straight in your head. And once you've done that, it starts to become clear what you need to do. Secondly, the layout of your question. Now, examiners are professionals. They're going to correct your paper as it shows, and they're going to do their best to give you as many marks as you deserve. But let's remember that they probably have a thousand of these questions to mark, and they will do their best. What you want, ideally, is to give your examiner every reason to give you five marks. And I know because I am an examiner, I will look at a layout like this, and I can instantly tell in about two seconds that this person deserves five marks. If you're fairly messy by nature, you must try and practice doing questions like this, because you want to be able to give your examiner every reason to give you marks. And this does that. You can see 
straight away that they've used the correct equations. So just write down the equations. It takes less than a second to do. You can see straight away that they've put in the correct numbers in the correct place. That's another mark. You can see straight away what they're doing with the energy and the time. And then write down at the bottom with a little space so that it's very clear that's your statement at the bottom. It doesn't take up an awful lot of space. It doesn't take up an awful lot of time. This is question 11 on the paper. So this is the first written question. And what this also does is a psychological boost for you. It puts you on the right track very early. And you're in the right mindset then. You are organizing your information, you're getting your equations down, you're doing your calculations. You know, also not just the examiner, you know you have done the right thing and you know you're getting those five marks, and that's a great psychological boost at the start of the paper. So, if you're not super neat, and I'm not super neat, but if you're not super neat naturally, just get into the habit when you do your practice of laying it out very logically and so that it's very clear.